a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ, to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Well, good morning, Covenant. It's good to see everyone. I have been looking forward to this day for six months, I think. You know, next month I will have been preaching God's Word for 36 years. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I know I only look 36, but uh, yeah, I wish. Um, and you know, during that time, I have preached from the beginning to the end of most of the books of the New Testament. There's only a handful of books that I haven't done. The most major of the books that I have not done is the book of Romans. And probably one of the major reasons, certainly a, a major reason, is because it is a theologically daunting book. I mean, how do you take such deep doctrines that Paul teaches in this book and break them down into 30 to 35 to 45 to 65 minute, no, not 30 to 35 minute sermons and do them justice on a Sunday morning. How do you do that? I mean, the, there was a fella in the 19, uh, excuse me, in the 20th century, in the 1900s, uh, by the name of Martin Lloyd-Jones. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the most preeminent pastors in England, whose probably his work in the book of Romans is the gold standard. He preached through the book to his church. And you want to know how many sermons? 366 sermons. And he didn't make it to the end. He stopped halfway through chapter 14. If I was to adopt his methodology, our second graders over in Covenant Cove right now would be in college by the time I finished the book of Romans. So it's certainly theologically daunting. And I'm also aware, I've been very aware of the historical significance of this book, of, of how it has so deeply affected the men and women of God through the centuries. You know, for example... Uh, long before he ever visited our beautiful state, uh, St. Augustine in 386 A.D. Um, that was a joke. Uh, uh, Augustine in 386 A.D. was a rhetoric professor in Milan, Italy. Right? He'd been raised in a Christian home by a godly mom, but he had walked away from the faith. He had been living as a young adult, a sexually immoral, absolutely a debauched lifestyle. Uh, but he was a rhetoric teacher in Milan, and he began to go to the cathedral there to hear Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, who was a renowned pastor and preacher, very eloquent speaker. And uh, Augustine and Augustine enjoyed, I have a hard time being raised in Florida, not calling him Augustine, right? Uh, but Augustine uh, enjoyed hearing him speak and proclaim the word of God. In 386, he was taking a break out in the garden one day, and he heard a child's voice singing, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. And so as he's sitting there, he's thinking through his mind, he can't remember any games that a child would play that would sing that song. And so the more he thought about it, the more he thought, maybe this is God speaking to me through this voice of this child telling me I should pick up and read the scriptures. And so that's what he did. He got the scriptures and he just randomly opened up the scriptures to a passage and it happened to open to the book of Romans. It just so happened to open to Romans chapter 13 and he let his eyes fall upon the page and it was verse 13 
Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Oh my, Augustine. (laughs) But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And Augustine said that those verses struck the core of his soul And thus began his conversion and journey of faith. But no doubt, I think the single greatest reason why I have avoided preaching from beginning to end the book of Romans is my own awareness of my sense of falling short of what this book teaches and proclaims, of not measuring up to it. You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones, his testimony is that the reason... Uh, he resigned from the pastorate, was that he had a surgery coming up. And in that surgery, he saw God's hand removing him out of the pastorate because he was preparing messages out of Romans, out of being filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And as he knew in his own life, it did not describe him. So how could he preach what was not true for himself? And in that surgery, he saw God saying, it's time to step out of the pastorate and he resigned. I can certainly understand where he's coming from. I can relate to what he was feeling. But truth be told, church, just so you know, I don't measure up to any book in the Bible, much less the book of Romans. Right? And that right there is why Romans is so important. And why I feel like I can finally preach it. Maybe from beginning to end. Because I think finally... I'm at peace with myself that I don't measure up, that you don't measure up. We don't measure up, but Jesus measures up in our place. That's the gospel. And Romans is Paul's gospel masterpiece, right? And so, in this first message, for those of you, if you like an outline, we're going to take these first 12 verses and we're going to study it. It goes like this. There's the messenger of the gospel, the message of the gospel, and the movement of the gospel. This book is all about the gospel. No, we don't measure up. But Jesus measures up in our place. He starts in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This is a very traditional, typical beginning to an ancient letter. In an ancient world, you started with your name and a brief introduction and statement, maybe purpose for writing. Paul does this with all of the letters to churches that he writes. But this introduction is different from his other letters to other churches. For example, it's the longest introduction he gives. Uh, and verses 1 to 7 are one continuous sentence. It's also different in tone. And the reason why it's different in tone is because Paul does not know these people. And these people do not know Paul. You see, Paul did not plant and start a church at Rome, whereas the church at Corinth or church in Galatia and other churches that he wrote to, he was the church planter. This church didn't write Paul with a bunch of questions and ask him to give them insight on problems they were having like other churches did. And so he's writing from a totally different perspective. They know him by reputation, but they don't have a relationship with him. So in this introduction, he takes a totally different approach. He's he's much more diplomatic and tactful. He comes at them from a different angle than he does, say, the Ephesians or the Corinthians or others in order to really establish his credibility with them. And so what you see him doing, and for example, in verse 8, he talks about he's, how long he has been pra- uh, uh, praising or heard about their reputation and, and how well they have been doing and how he's been praying for them for years in verses 9 and 10. And then verses 11 and 12, he, he goes into this, these, talk, this, these verses about wanting to come and see them for quite some time. This has been on his heart, desiring to come to them. Why? So that they could minister to him. I mean, this is very un. Paul-like, right? I've been wanting to come and see you so that you could use your gifts to minister to me, and and maybe in some way I could minister to you, right? And and what he's actually doing here is in these opening verses, he's actually introducing 
one of the purposes of the book that he's not going to come back to until chapter 15. He, there's going to be, he, he does digressions all through the book of Romans, and this is his first major digression, right? He's not going to come back to chapter 15. But one of the reasons why he writes this letter is right here. I've been wanting to come see you for a long time. Well, why have you been wanting to come see us? Okay. In chapter 15, he explains it. In chapter 15, he says, I've basically finished my ministry in the eastern Mediterranean, the Adriatic. I've got nowhere else. To, I'm done in Asia Minor and Greece. I planted the churches. I'm ready to move on. I want to go to the western Mediterranean world. I want to go to Spain. So he says in, in Romans 15, verse 23, but now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, you see, he comes back to these verses, that, this idea that he mentions at the beginning of the book. I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. And here we go, to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. And then he goes on and he says, please pray for me because I think my life's in danger in Jerusalem, which we know it was. What's he doing? You see, he's, he's writing because you know, he wants these Romans to essentially be a base of operations for his ministry as he goes into the Western Mediterranean world. Kind of like he wants them to be to Spain what Ephesus, the church in Ephesus was for him in his ministry in Greece and Asia Minor. So he's setting the stage to make a big ask for this church here in this introduction. He starts out by saying, Paul. It's typical, right? In the ancient world, you started your letter by saying Paul or your name, right? And we first get to know this man at the end of Acts chapter 7, when the very first martyr in the Christian church, Stephen, is stoned to death. And in that story, a man by the name of Saul is there holding the coats and the cloaks of the men who were throwing rocks, killing and executing that Christian martyr. His name was Saul. We read a couple of verses later in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, that Saul began to ravage the church. Entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. He continued this uh, these, these episodes of persecution, arresting and, and imprisoning Christians. He has blood on his hands. Saul's name will be changed to Paul. Why? Because one day he leaves Jerusalem and he starts making his way up to Damascus with essentially arrest warrants for Christians that are there. You read this in the book of Acts. Along the way, Jesus miraculously intervenes in his life and Saul is converted he becomes a believer. At that point, for three years, he goes to the wilderness area to the east of Damascus. In the Bible, it's called Arabia, but not Saudi Arabia. It's just a different region. And in that area of Gentiles, the Lord Jesus ministers to him. His thinking is recalibrated. His heart is recalibrated. He begins to do ministry among those Gentiles for three years. And then he makes his way back down to Jerusalem to meet the apostles. Wow, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on that wall when he meets the apostles for the first time? Here's this man who has got blood on his hands from the saints of the church, and he walks in to meet these men. Pastor J. Thomas gives a great analogy. He says, imagine one day on a Monday morning, there's an African-American church in town. And the pastors are having their staff meeting when all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and the administrative assistant goes and opens the door and standing there and outside the door as a white man bedraggled, looks like he's been through the ringer, like he's met God himself and she and everyone in that community immediately recognizes him because he's an infamous white supremacist and a leader of the Ku Klux Klan. And he says, can I speak to the pastors, please? What do you think that woman's response is going to be? Abba, 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 right? right? And, she, and he comes in to those pastors, and he sits down, and he goes, I need to tell you a story. And he begins to say, I am no longer the man that I used to be. I've had an encounter with God and what I used to believe and say, I no longer believe and say, I understand how wrong I was. And what, what did those brothers do with this guy? I mean, did they believe him? 
is this a trick? How do we trust him? This is what's going through the apostles' minds. The, the, how, the, the church is skeptical. The, they're af- they, the scripture said they're afraid of him. You know what they do? They send him up to Asia Minor, to Tarsus, where he was born, and he hangs out there for about a decade. It's 12 years <laughs> before Saul, whose name is changed to Paul, begins the missionary journeys that we now know him for. Paul, servant of Jesus Christ. It's important how he begins his description. You know, he could have put his curriculum vitae out there, right? He could have said, I'm one of the best educated men in the Roman Empire, and it would have been true. He could have said, I have raised people from the dead. It would have been true. I've given people their sight. It would have been true. I've done miracles. It would have all been true. I've actually been killed, stoned, and raised from the dead myself. True. I've planted churches all throughout the world. I've opposed governmental leaders. True. He doesn't say any of that. Instead, he says, I'm a servant. Now, when we we hear this word servant, you know, we may have a tendency to picture you know, Jeeves the butler, you know, bringing cocktails to Winthrop out on the veranda. But that's not what he's saying here, right? It's not Jeeves the butler. The word here is doulos. It is literally slave. He chooses a term that would offend everyone in that church. Isn't that interesting? It's an expression in the Roman world that meant unfree. So there's, so there's no ambiguity here in his meaning. To the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, he will use a sister term that means galley slave. The guys who are chained to the bench at the bottom of the boat, rowing the boat, who go down with the boat when the boat is sunk. He says, I'm a slave. I'm a galley slave. Hey, Roman church, let me introduce myself. I'm Paul. I belong exclusively to one person, not the emperor of the city in which you live. I belong exclusively to Jesus Christ. I'm his slave. I'm his property. He can do with me whatever he wants to do. He has the power of life and death over me. My mission, my ministry, my life itself is defined by my master, Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Called to be an apostle. You know, isn't it important for us to realize what Paul is saying here as servants? Think about that just for a moment before we think about apostle. You know, all of us Christians, when we think about the gospel, freedom, and this book is going to talk a lot about freedom, there's a paradox here. True freedom is actually found in being a slave, a servant of Jesus Christ. And that's who we are. If you're a believer this morning, Paul says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You're bought with the price. Glorify God in your body. All of us, if we belong to Jesus, we're slaves, servants. But Paul, he was more than just a servant. He was an apostle. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, here's his introduction, but shorter, Paul, an apostle to the Galatian church, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, when he says apostle here, he's talking big letter A, capital letter A, apostle. In other words, he's been appointed by Christ to be his messenger and to fulfill the highest office in the New Testament church. Big letter A apostles, right? They received direct revelation from God and it became scripture. So a little bit different. Uh, uh, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, he describes the office in this way. He says the apostles were those men who actually had seen Jesus, who could give testimony that this is who Jesus was, that he had risen from the dead, they had received truth from Jesus, and that what they had communicated to the church was not myths and fables that they made up, but it was things that they could testify as being true. But even then... What they communicated to the truth came to them through the Holy Spirit's guidance. The Holy Spirit 
leading them and directing what they communicated just as he had done with the prophets in the Old Testament. So this is a very important office called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Paul had a clear understanding of his purpose in life, and he'd been called by God to be his messenger, marked out, separated to be his man, to do his work. And there's an irony here. You see, when Paul was persecuting the church, he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he was an uber Pharisee, right? And the word Pharisee means separated ones or set apart ones. The root word in the Greek for Pharisee and the root word for set apart is the exact same thing. But when Christ came into Paul's life, he's no longer separated, set apart from other people because he was so holy and pious. Now he's separated for the gospel of God. So let's turn to that. Let's go from the messenger of the gospel to the message of the gospel. You know, in the Roman Empire, when something great happened, let's say there was a military victory, a a big military victory, or or something happened in the empire that was extremely noteworthy, maybe a new emperor or something like that happened, the emperor or the senate would authorize heralds to go throughout the empire and to announce the news. I mean, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have, you know, the media like we do, they had men who would run throughout the empire and they would carry the message that the emperor or the senate wanted them to hear. That good message, the word for that was called euangelion, euangelion, right? And Paul here, when he says the gospel of God, he says the euangelion of God, okay? So this is the gospel. So in its essence, the gospel is an an announcement. It's a declaration of good news of something that has been accomplished or of something that has been done. So the word gospel and its message of what has been accomplished in Jesus Christ is central to the book of Romans. And if you think about it, it's logical, right? Since we know what he's going to say in chapter 15, we kind of have an idea of the purpose in this book. It's logical that Paul would make the gospel, the good announcement of what Jesus has done, central to the book because he's going to be appealing to this church to become a base of operations for ministry that he wants to do. And some of their natural questions, just like we have questions of, of men who come to us and say, would you help us plant a church? One of our basic questions is, explain to us what your message is. Tell us what you're going to be preaching and teaching. And we have questions about their doctrine and how they, what do they believe, right? These are normal questions that we would want to know. And so he preempts this by, in this letter, telling this church what he sees to be the essentials of the Christian faith of the gospel. He's telling them, if you, here's what I'm going to be preaching in Spain. Here's my message. This is what they need. This is what you need, Rome and church. This is what we need, Covenant Church. And so in these opening verses, he puts on the table for them a a few opening remarks about the gospel that we need to pay attention to. He says in verse 2 that the gospel is not some new fad. Instead, it's the fulfillment of ancient promises and prophecies. He says, I've been set apart for the gospel, verse 2, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, there where God is with Adam and Eve, they've sinned. He has had to curse humanity, but right on the heels of that curse is the first mention of the gospel, where God says there will come a seed of a woman who will crush Satan. He will redeem his brothers. And all through the scriptures in the Old Testament, beginning there all the way forward, we see promise and prophecy, promise and prophecy pointing to this day of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he says in verse 3 that it's centered on what Jesus did and who Jesus is right now. It's concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. It's the gospel is centered on what Jesus did in his first advent, in the incarnation. Jesus, God the Son, second member of the Trinity, he emptied himself of his glory 
of his rights. He takes on human flesh, not any human flesh, the flesh of one who is in the family line of King David as the prophecies foretold. And he fulfills all of the law. He becomes the propitiation of God's wrath, the satisfaction of God's wrath so that we can be redeemed as he'll talk about in Romans chapter 3. He becomes the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham as he talks about in Romans 4. He becomes the second Adam to undo the sin of the first Adam as he'll talk about in Romans chapter 5. I can just keep going on and on here as this is what he unpacks in the book of Romans. But who is he right now? Right? Who is he now? This is important for these Jews because the cross as a symbol of shame. You can't be a holy person if you've been killed on the cross according to the Jewish law. How can you be holy? How can you be God if you've been executed on a Roman symbol of execution in the Roman world? So who is he right now? Verse 4, he's declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. You see, with the resurrection, God reaffirms once and for all that Jesus, he was not some sinner that deserved to be executed. He is God in the flesh, the holy second person of the Trinity, not some criminal. He's the one who took on flesh to pay for the sins of his people. And today he lives in glory at the right hand of the Son of of the Heavenly Father. So the gospel, it's not a new fad. It's a promise fulfilled. The gospel is centered on what Jesus did, who he is right now. The gospel... It's a gauntlet thrown in the face of every would-be Caesar. Did you know that the, the earliest creedal statement of the church was two words? You find these two words etched in stone, for example, in the, the catacombs in Rome where the Christians would hide as the emperor would persecute them. You find it in other places throughout the Roman Empire. You find it in their writings. It was just two simple words, Jesus Kyrios, or Kyrios Jesus. Why those two words? Because you see, every year, Roman citizens had to go to a temple. And at that temple, they had to make a sacrifice. And when they made that sacrifice, they had to say, Kaiser Kyrios, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Christians couldn't say that. Why? Because as he says at the end of verse 4, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Kyrios. Jesus is Lord. Not that guy sitting in your city that you live in, Romans. He's not Lord. It's not Kaiser Curios, it's Jesus Curios. Jesus is Lord. Don't forget this. This is central to the gospel. He's saying, no, it's not what your culture says. It's what God says that matters. And these Roman believers who had been saying these words, they, by in that confession, they throw a gauntlet in the face of their own emperor And then time would back up this confession with the sacrifice of their lives. Church, when the competing, whether the competing Lord is a a human pretender like a a Caesar, Nero, or something in our world that claims our affections, something that we worship and we turn to instead of Jesus Christ. No matter what that thing is, the gospel is a gauntlet that smacks us right upside the head, disabusing us of our false religion and any idea that that idol is actually going to deliver what we hope it will deliver. It can't do it. Because the gospel, the good news, is a person. Jesus Christ our Lord. And he comes into our lives through his spirit and through that power he begins to change us and he moves within us and he begins to conform us into his image. So let's finish out with that. 
We've seen the messenger of the gospel and the message of the gospel. How about the movement of the gospel? Verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who were called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These verses put several ways before us that the gospel moves in our life, practically changing us. First of all, God has called every one of us. Notice there in verse 6, he says, including you who are called, right? In other words, God has called every one of us to be little a apostles spreading the gospel. We all have a calling on our life. Not big A apostles, but little a apostles. Remember, an apostle is a messenger, right? And a messenger of good news. We've been talking about this for over a year now, stressing it in our church. This time last year, we used the phrase, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and from 2 Corinthians 5, right? How, how we have been given the ministry of reconciliation through us. God is reconciling men and women to him. How? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our calling to be little a apostles. And we, hey, hey by the way, how's your, how's your three, two, one going church? You remember that? We've, we've, been, we've had our summer off, and so those of you who are in small groups, maybe you haven't been confronted with, you know, 321, how we have three people that we're praying for. And we're asking God to allow us to, to have at least two of those three become friends and have good relationships with them and, and then see God use us to bring one of those people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Continue to pray for three so that God would begin to use you. Secondly, as the gospel moves and works in our lives, it sets us apart from the world in which we live. Verse 5 has an expression, the obedience of faith. Now some have taken that to mean that the way we enter into the faith is that we obey. We obey to become Christians. That's not what this is saying. You know, Martin Luther used to have a saying along these lines. He said, um, we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. And what he was getting at was when Christ enters into our life, his spirit begins to move. He changes us. We don't stay the way we were. We will begin to see something happen. We'll begin to obey God's word and his law. We'll begin to look more and more like Jesus, right? He changes. Actually, verse seven, he says, we're called saints. Uh, we become holy. Now, God declares us holy, because he can see the end. He knows how we're going to end up. We may not feel very holy at any moment in time, but God knows the end of our story. He knows what he's going to do in our life. He says, you're a saint. Augustine didn't start out as Saint Augustine, did he? Yes, he did. Because God declared him to be a saint. Hey, look at the person next to you. Keith, Actually, let's do it like this. This is better. Marianne, look over at that guy next to you. Do you know his name is actually Saint Keith? How many of you can see that? I can't. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> I mean, you look up at me. How many of you can see Saint Jerome? That's my formal name. That sounds better, doesn't it? Saint Jerome, right? No, of course not. But yet, that's how God sees us. Why? Because he knows the end of our story and what he's going to do in our life, and what he has declared us to be. A third application. The gospel declares that the purpose of our lives is to make much of Jesus in every way possible. I love verses 4 and 5. He says in, at the end of verse 4, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. Now read with me. For the sake of his name, among all the nations. Okay, that, that, that was kind of pathetic. <clears throat> Look, it's football season, all right? I know some of you were much more energetic last night when Florida came back against Kentucky, all right? Use that voice, please. Let's, let's read that again. 
and use that voice when we come to the underlining uh, statement and read it with like a little bit of modicum of, in, of football enthusiasm, okay? Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. For the sake of the name of Jesus. Very good. Hey, what we do with our lives, what we're doing here at Covenant, it isn't, church, about us building monuments to ourselves. It's wanting to see Jesus glorified among the nations. I mean, Jonathan just came to us a few moments ago, and he, he gave us a report about our last year in Faith Promise Missions, and he's put it before us a challenge for this upcoming year how God has used our church to help make the name of Jesus great around the world. But my question is, for the sake of his name, what will you do this year? For the sake of his name, what are you prepared to do? What will you do for the sake of his name, husband and wife? Would you maybe consider that, that money that you spend on each other at Christmas? How about using that money to help plant a church instead for the sake of his name? Uh, for the sake of his name, how about using your vacation time and go down to Ecuador with JPeth and Monica and serve with our ministry partners or somewhere else? Uh, listen, it's going to look different for each of us, but don't miss the point that our purpose in life, why God has put us here, is to make much of Jesus and everything we do among all the nations, starting in our own backyard which is why we're sending out precious people in our church next week down to South Brevard because we want to see Jesus made much of in Brevard County. And this is why we give above and beyond so that we can see Jesus made much of and his name glorified around the globe. This is our purpose. One final application, verse 7. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through the gospel that God continually gives us his grace. And through that grace, we experience peace. And the good news of the gospel this morning is that if you came into this building this morning looking for peace, I don't know what's going on in your life, what struggles, what difficulties you may be facing. But I do know this, the answer to whatever it is that you're facing, the peace that you need, the only source of that peace is through Jesus Christ and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul will say in Romans chapter 10, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you will hum come to him and say yes, you're my master. I'm your servant. You own me. You're my Lord. Do with me whatever you will. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And my friend, that is the epitome of receiving God's grace. And it begins a journey of daily receiving God's grace. And with that grace comes shalom, peace. Amen. Father, thank you that through your son Jesus, we experience your peace. For the one here this morning who does not have peace, I would pray that peace upon them. Would you do a work of grace in their heart? Would you turn them to your son Jesus? If it's a Christian who's going through a difficult time in life, would you bring to them, to their attention, whatever it is, perhaps, that they're worshiping instead of Christ, that they're relying upon instead of Jesus? Would you bring them back to their first love? Would you do a work of grace so that they may have peace? Lord, if it's someone who has maybe never confessed the name of Jesus as Lord, would today be the day of salvation? Would you give them a new heart? Like you did for Augustine, Centuries ago, would you shine your light of redemptive love in their life? May they see the truth of who Jesus is. I ask this for their good and for the sake of Jesus' name, for his glory in their life. Amen.